I begin by um, acknowledging and thanking all of you uh, for your long-standing commitment and the witness to uh, the dignity of human life. I'm also encouraged to see the number here at this gathering, um, the numbers of young people and also those who are closer to my age. We won't go into what my age is, but I can tell that there are some close to my age here. And I know that this association uh, was established in the 1970s, and that one of the um, foundations has been the ability to have um, a voice through education and support, and therefore the need for charitable status, which I think is uh, an important a foundational principle for this group. Therefore, I realize that um, the ability to influence and to advocate in a political realm has sometimes been for you, uh, not a deterrent, but a certain uh, understanding of the limited um, scope to which you have chosen uh, to witness to human life. I don't mean that to be a, a denigration, please don't take it in that light, uh, because education on this particular issue of uh, human life is very important. The voice of the church, the voice of Christian communities, uh, those of goodwill who are representative in the membership here, uh, shows that this is not simply an issue that is faith-based, but it is an issue of all humanity. And that's why I think uh, we as Christians and Catholics must recognize that education is one of the building blocks in making sure that this truth about the dignity of human life is able to reach uh, each successive generation. The education uh, of the young is an important aspect in the common good of every society. And a society that values human life and truth must be able to have the ability to teach and to form the young. So I want to applaud this particular association and the uh, role and position that you have with regard to going into the Catholic schools. I know that you are able to go into schools uh, beginning in the fifth grade and then going up to grades 12. As I was talking, uh, it's Ellen, uh, she mentioned that she has been able to be successful much in the earlier grades, which is surprising. I think many times too, we have to get to the young, but those in high school, those beginnings grades nine, 10, and 11, and 12, uh, it's a formative time in which they are being bombarded with other values. And so I think the voice of the Pro-Life Association here in Calgary um, should and be uh, accepted in the high school. So having learned that this evening, uh, one of my uh, strategies will be to talk to the educators, and especially those at those levels of grades, uh, to ask, <coughs> excuse me, for the, um, the more openness to have Ellen uh, go into those grades and to be able to present the, the pro-life message. One of the things that education provides is uh, a grounding in the truth. And in our relativistic society where uh, truth is presented as choice, it sometimes becomes very difficult for pro-life members to be able to counter that relativistic uh, approach uh, to truth. It leads to a certain sense of individualism, that my choice, my understanding of what I choose to be true needs to be accepted because I'm an individual. The rights of the unborn are common rights. They're the rights of humanity. Unfortunately, again, our society is constructing the understanding of the dignity of the human person in the acquiring of simply individual rights. But the right to life is a value 
is a right that is held in common. And so these factors, I think, also mitigate or challenge this association, challenge the church in being able to have that message understood. That shouldn't deter us. One of the important things that the Alberta bishops have embarked upon, as well as the Ontario bishops, is the rewriting of the religion curriculum, growing in Christ, growing in faith. And through that curriculum, having been the author of the policy document for the Ontario bishops, I was very uh, sensitive to how we were going to be presenting uh, the church's uh, faith in the areas of morality, also the sacraments. And so understanding that sacraments of baptism, new life, needed to be touched upon and connected to uh, morality and issues of pro-life. So Catholic teachers, through the development of this new curriculum, uh, we are now at grade five, I can tell you that there has been a conscious and um, specific purpose in myself writing the policy document, but also in those who are now writing their curriculum and making sure that the materials that are available in Catholic schools will begin, not subtly, but in, a, in the appropriate way to present such truths about the dignity of the unborn. So this will be uh, new material through the Catholic schools that I hope such other lay associations within the church can be able to have an ability to acquire, either to learn about it and to know how to support it when you are going into the Catholic schools. So that's one particular aspect of education where I hope to sort of say to you that the church, the bishops, are conscious in the rewriting of this new religion curriculum to begin to be that explicit about such issues of the dignity of the human person and such pro-life issues. The other point of education that is also something that I've been uh, asked to be involved in as a bishop is through the Catholic Health Association of Canada. And as the bishop uh, uh, supporting Catholic hospitals, I have been aware of the fact that throughout the history of Catholic hospitals, the pro-life movement has in some ways uh, been a support to them, even though they have lost the ability, many of the Catholic hospitals, to provide obstetrics, gynecology, because of the issues of abortion. And so I can tell you that many of the Catholic health administrators doctors and nurses that have been involved in Catholic uh, hospitals have recognized the pain of giving up such ability of healthcare services that covers the gamut of human life. And so gradually we are being forced to uh, provide Catholic healthcare in specific areas of society and serving those who require, because of sickness, uh, certain uh, services, healthcare services. So mental health and now issues of aging and the elderly are becoming uh, the areas of healthcare to which Catholic hospitals are only able to operate. I have watched personally uh, Catholic hospitals having to let go of facilities and staff that were dedicated to the promotion of human life to allowing the gift of human life to be supported and the safe delivery of children in Catholic hospitals. And many people lament that ability for us to have an influence in the promotion and the care and the bringing to birth uh, of children in Catholic health facilities. The reason I share that with you <coughs> is because at the other end of the spectrum, which we now have in Canada, the most liberal laws that allow for physician-assisted suicide, and what I'm going to say bluntly is euthanasia, even though uh, society, the medical professions, want it to be identified as medical assistance in dying. This is also, I think, and I would present to you tonight, is another area for us 
to see that there is a continuum of pro-life witness and education. And even though you have been educating and continuing to present to the young the importance of the inviolability of the unborn, that they have the right to life, they are sacred and they have God's dignity in their human being, we also have to now begin to, in a sense, witness and educate at the other end of life. I draw upon Cardinal Bernadine, who in the 70s and 80s when I was studying, uh, introduced what seemed to be very problematic at the time was the continuum of the human um, person and the need for pro-life to not simply focus at the beginning of life, but to see that pro-life associations must see the continuum of the dignity of the human person. At the time in the 70s and 80s, I don't think that many people thought that euthanasia would become a reality or physician-assisted suicide. And yet it's almost prophetic that Cardinal Bernadine talked about the seamless garment of the human life pro-life movement. And it is coming to fruition. And so I want to sort of share with you is that it's, it's I don't think that pro-life associations should simply focus on one spectrum of human life it must in now embrace the full continuum of making sure that we educate our society on the dignity of all human life from conception to natural death. In introducing euthanasia and talking about medical assistance in dying, we can see that again, the use of terminology in our society is beginning to be shaping some of these life issues. So euphemisms, uh, terms that are ambiguous, that become somewhat acceptable to a secular society, we as bishops, and we talked about this both in Ontario and most recently at the Western Bishops, we need to be very clear about the terminology and the terms that we are using in terms of education and advocacy with regard to pro-life. We should not be co-opted into using the terms that society or the media are continually wanting us to sort of use in our debate and our discussion on these life issues. So it's important, I think, to, in our dialogue and our discussion with people, is to make sure that the terminology that we use is very clear, very succinct, and that we do not back down from some of those terms and realities. And this goes back to the importance of fundamental moral theology, that the terms that we use to describe who we are as human beings are terms that are objective. And terminology gets back into this debate about relativism, about subjectivism, and all of these terms then become very confusing for people. So many of our people say, well, is not uh, euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide already the same as someone who is you know, being given uh, medication to relieve pain? Isn't that the same as physician-assisted suicide? And so the, the distinctions and the confusion that is entering into conversations and debates, I think needs to be responded in very clear ways that there is a distinction between hastening death and allowing death to take place and to provide medication for the comfort of those who are experiencing extreme pain. In the debate around euthanasia, people want to describe suffering as unbearable. And here, Christians and Catholics begin to sort of say, well, suffering does have a, a physical reality it has a spiritual and an emotional reality. And therefore, we have to also say that suffering, not inflicted, but suffering freely chosen, supported by family and supported by society, can have a salutary benefit. And some people just do not want to accept the fact that suffering can bring life. And we as Christians and Catholics know that Christ 
undergone, underwent that uh, human condition of suffering so that you and I might receive and understand that that suffering does not lead to, to pain and separation from God, but can actually unite us. And how some families at the end of life will not be able to experience the true dignity of a loved one's life because a choice is being offered so that they can take their life and in some ways prevent others from experiencing the true dignity that each of us has. I myself, you know, have had a personal experience of being present to my father when he died and uh, was not able to be present when my mother passed away. And I know in my heart and in my experience and in my relationship with God and with my parents, there is something that has always sort of been missing in not being able to have the gift of being present when my mother passed away. I pray and I know that that gift was given to me from for being with my father. Some family members don't have that. But I think society is telling people, well, now you have the choice not to be. And some feel that that is the way in which they are sort of honoring the dignity of another person. And that's not true. So by sort of talking about euthanasia, I just want to expand our horizon to sort of be aware of the importance of human suffering and from a Christian point of view that we have to sort of be able to explain that suffering can be salutary and, and effective. We also have to be aware of in these debates, as I said, the terminology, the euphemisms that can be used because they are, in a sense, in this whole debate, uh, I think very confusing for many of our people. Um, the, the other thing that I would share with you this evening is um, the importance of what is happening here. Um, our society, which sometimes feels that the human person um, has the ability and the freedom to um, make a difference as individuals, our society sort of affronts that. I think that the greatest strength is when we see people gather. and. In talking before, I asked about whether some go and, and are present each week at some of the clinics or the hospitals where abortion takes place. How many? If there's one person, there's two or three. It's not a question of the numbers, but the fact that you as a community and you as a group make that choice each week to stand for life and stand beside one another that, to me, I also think is an important uh, recognition of the fact that this cannot be something that individuals do, but it is through an association and a group of people. You are stronger when you stand together. And this becomes a, a very sore point oftentimes, is that as we as bishops know that even in the church, there isn't necessarily agreement and even in lay associations and movements, there's not agreement. But I think where we can work towards what I talked to our pastoral staff about today, the spirituality of communion that John Paul II talked about, that this was the communion that is needed for the new millennium, that the spirituality of us being able to see ourselves as a gift for one another, that we are not seeing our brothers and sisters in a way that in some ways we are envious because they have certain gifts that we do not have. But we see that the gifts that are being uh, evident in a group of people are gifts that all of us share and that that becomes a, a recognition as well. So even though some days or Saturdays, so I came from Peterborough, I remember going out on Saturdays um, once or twice with them. Sometimes there was two people, sometimes there was three. Some were there with a sign, others were simply there praying. Two or three would gather each Saturday and witness. And it did not go unnoticed by the doctors and nurses who went into the public general hospital in Peterborough. It was a silent reminder to many of them 
that what had to, is and was taking place in the public general hospital, they themselves knew that it was wrong. That these people, from the very moment that abortion started in the public general hospital in Peterborough, there was a pro-life community and a group that witnessed every Saturday. And that did not go unnoticed by the doctors and nurses. Some Catholics who were grateful working in that hospital, not having to do abortions, but they were grateful. I had many doctors and Catholic nurses say they appreciated the Catholics and Christians who would go each Saturday and witness. So you have to hear that message that even though sometimes it may be discouraging and you may not think that you are making an impact, <coughs> I think you are. Because when we witness to the truth, what it does is it convicts people in their conscience. Their conscience is where the voice and the truth of God resides. And we as Christians and Catholics must always witness to that truth. And in doing so, we are witnessing to the dignity and the conscience of every individual. As society wants to confuse how, under, how people understand the decision of conscience, we as Catholics must always witness to the truth. So that was another point that I wanted to uh, share with you because I know that it can seem discouraging that abortion is still existing. The other point that I would um, make is, is to the young who are here and it was uh, pointed out uh, two years ago at the March for Life in Ottawa. Where there, and this is another important thing that is downplayed. It is the largest public demonstration in Ottawa every year. You will never have it reported. It's always underestimated, but it's close to now 20,000 or more who come each March, <coughs> thank you, for that particular pro life march. But what was interesting was that someone made the statistic and made it to the young people that because of abortion for close to 20 or 30 years, there was close to about a quarter of a million young people who would have been born, who would have been at this march and standing beside you. Now when you point it out in that particular way for the young people, it begins to convict them in their conscience as well. And I saw it in the youth rallies that year it became an awareness. It was one of those moments that it just sort of struck them and said, you know, because of abortion, people that I would be standing here with were killed. And that is the reality of abortion in our Canadian society. Cardinal Collins has recently written a letter to Justin Trudeau and he has sent it to each of the bishops. We have allowed the Cardinal, even though all of us as bishops uh, can write these letters, and we should and we will, but we have sort of deferred to the Cardinal of Toronto the uh, ability to be the advocate on behalf of all of the bishops and the Canadian Conference of Bishops to write on these particular issues. So I can send to many of the parishes, and I don't, I'm still learning how the diocese communicates, but uh, the letter in Peterborough, I would send the letter out to all of the parishes and have them publicly put it in the bulletin so that, that the parishioners know that we the bishops are trying to stand up to the government and point out the truth. So he has written a letter basically calling into question his decision to allow the funding for uh, Planned Parenthood in developing countries. So. At some point as well, uh, we are going to be pushed farther and farther to the point that we may have to make decisions around whether we should be telling people to pay their taxes. It's, I hate to, I think it's an easier sell in, in Alberta <laughs> than it would be in, in Ontario. I can tell that already in two weeks, but um, I think it would resonate with people here in Alberta, that that type of decision and witness uh, could be a way to be effective in terms of these particular issues. Um, 
The other point I would like to say is that some people here um, may be called to public office or want to allow your name to stand. Um, it's a noble profession. It's not that uh, you should be a, a candidate on one issue, but in terms of uh, maybe considering public office, uh, it is uh, uh, a noble calling. Um, I, and I say that in, in, these, in those words, is that it is a life of service if it's understood that way. Um, having read this summer the autobiography of Paul Martin, who is a liberal MP from uh, Windsor, a great pro-life back then, uh, even in the Justin Trudeau's, uh, or Pierre Trudeau's cabinet, he opposed it. But in his autobiography, he, uh, he really had a sense of the calling to be uh, a statesman, a politician, one who would uh, go above partisan politics and basically serve the common good. And at one point in the autobiography, he said, of the two callings, he felt that uh, those called to be a priest and to preach the truth and proclaim the word of God, uh, next to that would be a politician who could uh, promote the truth and allow society and to serve that truth for the common good. So I share that with you as I think that some of you, uh, and, and to encourage others, that if they are being called to, to uh, uh, public service from groups such as this is to encourage them so that they can become the voice and the advocacy that you have chosen not to because of um, charitable tax status. So that shouldn't deter you from encouraging those within the Calgary area, people of goodwill, men and women who might feel that they can make a difference in our Canadian society for life issues. Now for euthanasia, abortion, issues of shelter, the homeless, all of those. And that gets back to what I said, is that we as a church must be able to show a consistent, integral witness to human life. That we have outreach to the poor, that we feed the homeless here in Calgary is amazing. Not done in, on this scale in Toronto, I can guarantee you. And issues around Elizabeth House, for unwed mothers that I've come to learn about here, much larger outreach to youth and to women in, in pregnancy, and also at our pastoral center. For those women who have had abortion, as Pope Francis has said in the Year of Mercy, that we have had to, in our own way, to accompany them who have made that choice. And not to judge, but allow them to come back to the truth. And many of them have. And they come on retreats, and the church provides that healing. So all of those become ways that we can be consistent about our witness to the dignity of human life, whatever the condition a human person finds himself in. And I think that that is the beauty of the Christian church, is that we see that, and you can be involved in lay associations that reach out to the poor, to reach out to young women, to reach out to the elderly. So. I really want to end with just a sort of saying my words of reflection here I think are just uh, uh, in a way to affirm many of your own experiences I hope uh, to encourage you about the particular focus of this group with education and just to make us aware of uh, you know what we do face and it is a, a culture that does not accept the dignity of human life and it is going to be a greater challenge here in our society of Canada for such associations to witness to the dignity of human life. So thank you for your faithful witness. Thank you.